envoy to Yemen, Martin Griffith, spearheaded and shepherded the tentative truce, and he joins me now from Brussels. Martin Griffiths, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. So, a special envoy, clearly you know what I just uh, announced. It's just been said that there is a ceasefire that is set to go into effect tomorrow. Give me as much as you know and what you expect that to achieve. Well, I th the, as you were saying in, in your lead-in there, the, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to flesh out the exact timing of different withdrawals. But essentially, it's as follows. The ceasefire will go into force at midnight tonight, one minute after midnight. Um, we would expect the parties at that point to down tools, to stop fighting, the sky to go quiet over the data. Uh, we will plan to hold the first meeting of the uh, monitoring committee that w the UN will chair with the parties. And that committee is tasked to flesh out the details which were discussed in Sweden but need further elaboration. But mm -hmm. essentially, this month, by the end of this month, we should have seen withdrawals of a substantive nature from both the port and away from the main Sana Hodeida Road. Mm -hmm. So that's very, very quick indeed. So the, the system is, is, is in urgent mode at the moment. So let me just ask you, before I get into the nitty gritty of the whens and the wheres and the timings and the withdrawals, etc., cetera, um, just in, you know, mm. overarching, this seems like extremely good news. And you described it as happening very fast after, I mean, literally no movement whatsoever, despite all your best efforts over the last two and a half plus years. Yes, it was, it was a breakthrough, in fact, because to get parties together around a table or in the same building after two and a half years of battle, which is continuing to in fierce, fierce battles all over Yemen, to get them into the same room was itself something of an achievement. And then to be able to come out from that after eight days in Sweden of really you know, hard work with this kind of uh, agreement, I think is remarkable. But bear in mind that uh, we had spent many months uh, before Sweden trying to negotiate similar arrangements for Hodeida with the support of the Security Councils. So we, we knew where we wanted to go, but for the parties to agree with where we all wanted to go is still a remarkable tribute to them. Mm -hmm. So, so Hodeida, let's just be clear, is the main port. It's the one where all the humanitarian aid should come into, and it's really the lifeline, the major sea lifeline anyway, of, uh, of Yemen. So I just want to know whether you agree that, um, that, that some of the awful things that have happened recently, including the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, played a significant part in focusing people's attentions. How did you notice the willingness um, of, of the main major parties change, the willingness to engage in this way? Well, I think I, we were able to see movement to see change in that uh, regard back in August, August, September, so before the events in Istanbul. Um, and we saw the Saudis, for example, who are clearly a key, a key actor in this, uh, in the lead of the coalition supporting the government of Yemen. We saw them moving towards the realization, I think because of what happened on the battlefield and because of the looming famine, that there was really no alternative now but to to move rapidly on a political solution. The Security Council united all the time on Yemen, which is another lucky Yemen in that regard, has been calling for exactly that uh, for some time. So we saw predating these more public uh, events that you were describing, we saw a shift in favor of peace. Uh, having said that, there's no doubt that the attention, the world attention, uh, is, is helpful in the sense that it focuses all our minds um, on, on making this happen. And what, what made Sweden work was international consensus and the specific acts of a number of different leaders, one of which, Mohammed bin Salman, was instrumental uh, on three different occasions in regard to the Swedish talks. Well, you are throwing a bone to the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, who's under huge international uh, skepticism and, and criticism right now. So what were the critical moments, you say, three critical moments in getting to where we are right now? 
the, the key one was the conversation that uh, the Secretary General of the UN, who, as you know, came to Sweden as the closer for those last 24 hours, spoke to the Crown Prince. He also spoke to President Hadi of Yemen. And these conversations uh, behind the scenes formed, sort of made the confidence available to agree on Hodeida in particular. Mm -hmm. So that was of critical importance in those last, in those last hours. And so I'm not throwing anybody a bone. I'm simply describing what happened. And, and what is important to remember about Yemen, I think, is that there is a consensus internationally in many countries, in the Security Council, and among Yemenis, that this can be resolved and should now be so. So let's go through some of the public statements. You just mentioned the Secretary General. I want to play what he said and then have you flesh out exactly what you think is going to happen at Hodeida. This is what he said about what should happen at the port. You have reached an agreement on Hodeida port and city, which will see a mutual redeployment of forces from the port and the system and the establishment of a governorate-wide ceasefire. The UN will play a leading role in the port, and this will facilitate the humanitarian access and the flow of goods to the civilian population, and it will improve the living conditions for millions of Yemenis. Okay, so, so do you know now any more details as to exactly how that's to work? I mean, have warring parties said that they will hand over control of the port to the UN? Um, is there a fixed timeline? Are you confident that this actually will happen? We, we, we have lots of detail on that. Uh, for example, because it will be the World Food Program which will take the lead in backstopping the Port Authority. Uh, and improving conditions in the port and making sure that customs and revenues is handled in a, in a new way. And they have already plans for how many people they need to deploy and when they can do it. So uh, in terms of the United Nations system's response to what the Secretary General was announcing there, I think we're well on the way uh, to, to, to putting those things in place. What we hope will happen is this. The ceasefire will come into force, as we say, in a few hours' time. Uh, we hope the fighting will stop, but in the beginning it won't be monitored. UN monitors will deploy as soon as possible. We hope to get the first core team in there before the end of the week uh, to, to monitor and report to the Security Council weekly on whether the parties are compliant. And the, the, the first withdrawals will be from the port and then to allow the key humanitarian road from Hodeida to Sana, where supplies will go from the port through Sana'a to the rest of the country of vital importance, will then open up. And we hope that that will happen, as I was saying earlier, before the end of December. And I think it's important to recognize that these withdrawals and redeployments are essentially guided by the sense of humanitarian need. So uh, liberating the port and enabling the UN to backstop it is humanitarian. Uh, opening up that road, which is now closed through conflict, mm -hmm. from Hodeida to Sana. Similarly, mm -hmm. this is a humanitarian uh, project, a humanitarian stopgap to enable the people of Yemen to avoid the catastrophes that we fear. Mm -hmm. uh, but it goes beyond that. There is, as, you, as the Secretary General said, uh, a governorate-wide, a province-wide ceasefire, and we have to remember that not only is Hodeida the humanitarian hub for the country. It's also the center of gravity of the war. It's where the main battles have been going on in recent weeks. So calling a ceasefire in Hodeida is a massive signal to the people of Yemen that something new is, uh, is, is possible, that might, we, we might see something happening. So uh, I think if we can make all this happen according to plan, we will be very, very fortunate, and the people of Yemen will notice a new prospect for the future. So the future, will that involve another round of convening of all these officials once the humanitarian corridors have been opened, if indeed that does happen to your expectations. Is there next planned a, a political settlement? Yes, we have, to, we have to negotiate a political settlement on the basis of the Security Council resolutions that guide me, of course. Um, 2216 is the main one. And essentially, we need a political agreement between the government of Yemen 
and uh, the parties in Sana and Sarala to, who came together in Sweden uh, to resolve the issues of the war, to return to the state the monopoly of force with withdrawals and uh, disarmament to form a coalition government. What I hope to do is to reconvene the parties in late January. The Secretary General spoke to President Hadi about that uh, last Thursday. Uh, so that we can start the process of looking at the political issues mm -hmm. and the substance of any eventual agreement. There is so much experience in previous talks in Yemen of the options. Uh, the, the, the latest, the last one, sadly being two years ago, but such a lot of experience we can draw on that I believe that we can go fairly quickly, if the political will is there, to a settlement that will end the war and that will give us the basis to start building peace. So let us talk about the political will. And again, you're highly experienced, and you know what this is all about. This is a proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran. I mean, that's what it's being portrayed as. It's the Saudi-led coalition for the free Yemeni forces versus the Iranian-backed Houthis, or at least that's what the public narrative is. Um, why all of a sudden is, will there be political will to settle what essentially is the fight between the US and Saudi Arabia and the UAE versus Iran? Well, I don't, I don't actually agree with that narrative. I don't think it is a simple proxy war, as indeed you rightly say, it is often described as such. I think it's firstly a Yemeni war between Ansarallah, the Houthi movement, uh, and the government of Yemen. And by the way, one in a series. They've been fighting each other for some years. So that's the, 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 the primary war, and that's got nothing to do with Saudi Arabia or Iran. But clearly, there are interests at stake. Uh, we all know that. There's nothing surprising. I don't think there's anything shocking about that. So uh, to resolve this conflict, we have to combine both mediation between the Yemeni parties of the sort that we saw last week, uh, as well as sort of an alignment of international interests. And indeed, Sweden did that too, mm -hmm. because Sweden was not only negotiated around the table in Sweden, there was constant contact with these various capitals uh, to, to get help to ensure that what were the parties were discussing could be translated into agreements. We need to continue that. I believe there is a new wave of political will uh, to settle this conflict. I think the terrible threat of famine has been a huge uh, focus for all of our minds. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I, don't, I think it's very clear the battleground is not the place where this conflict will be resolved. Months of assault on Hodeida did not lead, lead to a solution there. So I think the parties can see that military solution is not available. Political solution has to be the one that uh, is now the priority. So then is this a contradictory statement or a statement that recognizes what you've just said? This is from Khalid bin Salman, who's Saudi Arabia's ambassador to the U.S. This is as this, uh, these talks were, were underway, December 30, last week. He said, the legitimate government of Yemen supported the former U.N. envoy's proposal of U.N. control over the port of Hodeida. The Houthis refused and only consistent military pressure by the Yemeni armed forces and the Arab coalition forced them to agree. So he's essentially saying, well, actually, it was a military solution, and we've beaten them to the negotiating table. Yes, well, I think he may be right. You know, I am not a military person. Uh, and, I, you know, there's a limit to how much you or I can peer into the minds of those who may be responding to pressure or maybe responding to opportunity or maybe just doing the right thing. Uh, so I think everybody has a different narrative from where they come to. For me... Uh, what's important, and I'm sure for, for the people of Yemen, what's important is simply sensible offers put to the parties that can be backed up by verifiable uh, compliance. Mm -hmm. And the, the, what the United Nations brings to this, with the support of the Security Council, of course, is the second. Mm -hmm. we, we're able to put offers in front of the table to the parties, but we can also uh, help with the verification uh, of, of, of those offers and the compliance of the parties. So it may be political, it may be military pressure, it may be political opportunity, whatever it is, something happened last week in Sweden and it's up to me to capitalize on it. Indeed, and, and you seem to be capitalizing very well. And the people of Yemen will thank you 
and they obviously need uh, 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 an enormous amount of help. I mean, millions and millions, as you said, are uh, on the verge of starvation if nothing changes. And we've seen, as I said, uh, so many children dying every day of cholera and famine, and the pictures are truly heartbreaking. I just want to put this to you, though, in terms of pressure. I mean, clearly, Saudi Arabia cares what happens in the United States, in Washington. Its biggest uh, arms supplier, its biggest backer is the United States. And the Senate, as I said, did invoke the War Powers Resolution um, to, 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 to prevent President Trump continuing support. Obviously, the House has a say and the House has, uh, disagrees, but this could change. So clearly, the, the, the participants were also looking at what was happening to their backing. But what I actually want you to respond to is the following. I spoke to um, the Houthi-backed foreign minister, Hisham Sharaf Abdullah, who I believe was at the talks, and he actually said, as much as they thank you for your efforts in the UN, the real center of gravity is in Washington. This is what he said. The only country in the world that can stop the war, and I say it in front of the whole world, is the United States not the United Nations. It's the U.S. who can stop this war because they are the strongest packers of the Saudis. Uh, what do you say to that, Martin Griffiths? I mean, you know, he's basically saying that, well, it's not you, actually. It is the United States. Hmm. I'm happy, happy with that. Um, you know, the U.N. doesn't have any battalions. It's the Pope that has no battalions. The U.S. is playing an absolutely crucial role uh, in at this moment, uh, I believe, and I say that because I have many, many contacts with U.S. officials, both in the region and back in Washington, uh, and the Secretary General even more so than me. Um, so the U.S. has a key role in helping nudge the events forward in the right way, and they have been doing so. And they have been very, very active on this file, not just uh, with their uh, uh, allies in the Saudi Lake Coalition, but with others. Uh, and the British Foreign Secretary, as you know, came to um, uh, Sweden also as a sort of closing uh, encouragement. And he met with the leadership of both parties. That's the first time, I think, that mm -hmm. British uh, Foreign Minister has met with the representatives of Ansarallah. That's good news for me. The more help we get from powers, the happier Yemen will be. Uh, but, and this is the, the UN view, of course, it's a Yemeni solution that needs to be decided. So the, the, the solution is not in Washington. The solution is not in Riyadh. The solution is between Yemenis. And, and, and that's part of the UN's job, I think, is to preserve that value. Mm -hmm. and that's why it was incredibly important for me that the Secretary General decided to attend to help, and made us work very hard to help the end of that uh, eight days in Sweden and to understand what, what happened there? I mean, you, you, you don't say no to the Secretary General very easily. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that was also very, very important. Uh, at least not to his face. Of course, we have to wait and see what actually does transpire on the ground uh, and whether the ceasefire does go into effect. And everybody will be hoping it does. I just wanted you just to end by, by sort of laying out the disastrous fate of the Yemeni people under, under this bombardment, under this, you know, this, this war that's gone on for the last three plus years. Um, you know, we, we talked about millions of people facing famine. And it is extraordinary, it is extraordinary that people in the United States are really attuned now to this. And it is since the murder of Khashoggi that Yemen was put front and center. And they've seen pictures and, and they're really horrified by it. Just explain what will happen to the people there if this ceasefire doesn't stick. And, and I'm glad you, that is your question, because there, you know, nobody should be uh, too complacent about that. There are lots of reasons why it may not stick, why uh, things may go wrong or not in time. So I think it's incredibly important to stay focused on trying to make it work. But I'm, I'm glad you put that question, because the alternative uh, is, is horrifying. Famine is different, as you know, uh, from hunger. Famine is a viral uh, problem, and famine is already uh, in some of the uh, provinces of Yemen. And if we don't preserve the humanitarian pipeline, which is where we started this conversation, then there is every likelihood that famine will grow, and cholera with it. And UNICEF, I, I remember having a conversation with the executive director of UNICEF, Henrietta Four, who went to Yemen uh, not long ago. And she said to me, you know, people talk about this being 
uh, a failing state. It's failed. The systems aren't there now. Uh, the, the numbers are frightening. We're all, the UN is already feeding 8 million a month people. There is a fear that it could go to 14. That's half the population of Yemen. The costs of this program are enormous. And I believe one of the reasons why this war has gone on as long as it has is because those pictures haven't come out of Yemen. It's been difficult, as you know, of course, for journalists to get access to mm -hmm. uh, parts of Yemen that they need to, to tell the story. And it's extraordinarily important that uh, they have done and they are doing. And this is a, a spur to all of us. So, uh, and, and finally, Yemen is important not just for the Gulf region. Uh, I'm st in Brussels at the moment. The Red Sea uh, shipping lanes and the trade that comes through there is of huge importance, of course, for Europe. Yemen, its geography makes it of, of a critically important state. And stability in Yemen, and we haven't even touched on the issue of terrorism in Yemen, stability in Yemen is important for all of us, not just for people in their region and not just for Yemenis themselves. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Well, we, we really wanted to focus on the plight of the people because we do remember how huge it was as a, as a, as a generator of terrorism, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and all the plots that, that have come out of there. So for every reason, it's mm -hmm. important mm -hmm. that this be solved. Martin Griffith, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much indeed. So.